Hello. Hello. How are you both? Very good. Very good, thank you. So we're here today with um, John Stallard, CEO of Warlord, and Steve Morgan, author of Pike and Shot. Hi. And today um, they are going to talk to us about Scott's Covenanters. Hopefully, yes. Oh, yes. (laughs) Pills of wisdom and all that. John, you can start. Scott's Covenanters. Who were they, Steve? (laughs) Well, um, they were broadly people who had signed the National Covenant in 1638, such a long time ago. Um, And basically it was, they had decided that they'd had enough of all this interference coming from the English king, King Charles, on how to run their church. And they were pretty successful in getting pretty much all the nobles in Scotland against these changes, especially the prayer book. And when King Charles pushed the issue by sending troops north, they raised an army. Um, they had some pretty solid, solid guys on their side. On politically, um, they had uh, Marcus of Argyle. Is this 1639? Are we talking about the Bishops' Wars? The Bishops' Wars were, came a year later. The National Covenant was signed in 1638. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. And then it took a good 12 months for, or slightly less, for King Charles to realise he was slightly <coughs> annoyed by this. Sent troops north. By which time, um, Archibald Cameron, uh, Campbell, sorry, um, Argyle, and uh, the Earl of Leven, Alexander Leslie, had politically and militarily got the Covenant uh, forced together and had raised twenty thousand men and assembled sixty cannon. And the English went, you know, that's that's probably quite a lot of them. We'll back down. And that was the start of the Covenant movement. Now, what was intriguing, as I found out at the weekend when I was away on a holiday, is that uh, the Earl of Montrose, who would then become the uh, the antithesis of the Covenanters, he was actually a Covenanter to begin with. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He took Aberdeen in 1639 in the Bishop's Wars, and then was with um, he's with Levin when they marched south. Newburn, and then took Newcastle. He was one of the leading figures of the Covenanter army. But then, I say, went on to be the king's representative in uh, in some unbelievably exciting battles up in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, yeah, quite the man. Yeah, because I mean, your your Covenanter army. I saw your Covenanter army in twenty eight bill coming together. How long ago now? That's oh, twenty five years ago now. When I first started doing Covenant. Yeah, because from a war gaming point of view. You'd think an army that was mostly in hodden grey, mostly wearing blue bonnets, mostly infantry, would look a bit dour and samey. And they don't. They look phenomenal on a battlefield. They look equally good, if not better, than other British Civil War armies. Um, I'm not sure what it is. It may be the uniformity that makes them look so or, or the flags. Because the, the standards of the Covenant were fantastic. And they were very well organised, aren't they? Well equipped, well organised, well trained. In fact, with a lot of their officers, of course, have been abroad, haven't they? In yeah. the Large, Years' War? Yeah, largely in the Swedish army in the early 1630s. Certainly Levin and most of the office class, um, Bailey, um, David Leslie, they'd, they'd all been in the, in the Swedish army. And they were yeah, very well led, very well organised. Say the fact that they could raise regional regiments of, you know, the, the, for an army of twenty thousand men at the drop of a hat, and within long, uh, within a short period of time, they had regiments in Ireland um, marching into England by sixteen forty-four, the Battle of Marston Moor, and obviously in in Scotland because they were fighting the civil war against the, the Scots royalists led by Montrose at this point, so they were pretty pivotal everywhere. Um, it's, it's common for people to talk about the New Model Army of 1645 mm-hmm. as being the first uniformed uniformed army, uh, all in their Venice red coats. Yeah. But you talk about the Covenant as being in a Hodden Grey, H-O-D-D-E-N. Yeah. yeah. Hodden Grey. Arguably, surely they're the first uniformed force. Uh, you'd think so, yeah. I mean, and, and what is Hodden Grey? Are you wearing Hodden Grey today? Sort of. It's, it's kind of... Just mostly undyed, undyed wool or like a 
brownish grayish off-white color that I guess was just cheap to produce. If you were going to equip 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 men, you know, dye was quite expensive. So dyeing all their coats in a variety of colors might have looked great, but was horribly expensive. I think the Scottish took a very pragmatic approach, which was how do we equip them? Let's spend that money on some guns and making sure they've got the weapons um, and save a bit of money on dye. Uh, I noticed in the, in, I was looking at the models, uh, I know they had a good artillery train mm. and they had good gunners, but uh, I also noticed they got these, um, I think they're called frame guns. Could you tell me something about those? What's a frame gun? Yeah, a, a very light mobile artillery piece that kind of could, could be manned and you know, moved around by three men usually, but sometimes two. Um, and sometimes they had, they had multi-barrels. Um, so they were, they were lightweight, mobile, um, either a single small bore gun or a multi-barrel gun. And are they firing cannonball or case shot? Uh, cannonball, no, mostly, yeah, yeah. I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one of the things, again, looking at the illustrations and looking at our models, the one thing that I don't see on the infantry is any armour. Mm. What's that about? Because people, you'd think of your pikemen especially, would be with a back and breast and a helmet and gorget and whatever you could, oh, that's not a Scottish thing? Not, not really. I think there were some instances of local militia, like the Aberdeen militia, who actually didn't wear Holden Grey, they, they wore different uniform colours wearing armour, but the, the Covenanter army did not appear to go into, go into battle, go into war with armour, possibly because it was hideously expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how about, uh, how were the cavalry, how would they compare to uh, what they were going to face down <laughs> south in Sassanac land? You, you have hitting on probably the, the main <coughs> weakness of the Covenant. Of, I, I think their horse was good enough for what they had to do in Scotland, their immediate needs but proved to be inadequate later on as, as the war stopped. Certainly they were found out when they came up against the new model army at Dunbar. By that point, um, the, yeah, the, the lack of good quality cavalry was very much a disadvantage. But certainly um, within their, um, the, uh, the allied nature they had with, with the new uh, the, um, parliamentarian force, it, that was never a problem in the, in the First Civil War, um, and the the strength that they had in their infantry being well organised and well led and well equipped, and the strength of their artillery far outweighed that. Because I, I, I've heard their their horses being described as small nags. Yeah, not, yeah. not the great horse flesh of probably not what no. cavalry became later on with the new model cavalry. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it may, may be a little unfair to call them old legs, but yeah, they certainly weren't. It wasn't the strength of this. I see some of them equipped with lances. That yeah. looks quite medieval. Uh, but efficiently brutal, or brutally efficient, whichever way you... I, I certainly wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. No. But, I, I, again, I think a pragmatic, pragmatic political and, and military machine, I think is the best way of describing the Covenanters, and they were very, very good at what they did. No friends to the Royalists in Scotland, Montrose's forces? No, I think as in any civil war, it could be pretty brutal. Um, although once, once the English Civil War had got to a stage where the king who actually surrendered to the Scots, that's how important the Covenanters were, They'd be the king actually surrendered to the, the Covenanters outside Newark. Yes, and what did the Scots do with their king? Well, they then handed him over to Parliament. They, yeah. they, did, they didn't hand him yeah. over. <laughs> they, well, yeah, escorted him, shall we say. Sold him. Well, <laughs> yes, that's, that's a bit harsh, but yes. But it's a deal. <laughs> it, it is, um, but of course they weren't counting on Parliament uh, and the English Parliament and being taken over by pretty radical uh, movement who then executed him and that wasn't part of the deal no, that's and then enough. quickly the alliance fell apart and the covenanters were on the other side and they were so again so the, uh, getting a covenant army is cool because they look great yep 
They've got combined arms, pretty yep. much. Yeah, they, uh, simple to paint, yet elegant. Um, and they fought in the Bishops' War, so 1638. 1639, 1640. Yep. So that's early on. Uh, then they fight against the king. Yep. Uh, and then they fight twice against Parliament. Yep. And then they're in Ireland. And they're in Ireland Fighting as well. everybody. Yeah, fighting everybody. And, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and they're also in the Thirty Years' War fighting with on the Swedish side. Yeah. Brigades and regiments yeah, or I individuals? Mean, they, they would look the same. They weren't actually covenanters at that point because the covenant was signed. In 1638, but the look of the, oh, the, yes, the, of the models absolutely could be um, in, a, in a Swedish army. So they, they're the universal go-to soldiers? Absolutely. Well, thanks, Steve. That's, uh, that's who the Covenanters are and why you should buy an army immediately. Um, anything else to say, Steve? No, that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much for inviting me along. Thank thanks, you fellas. for your time. Thank you.